So we, we totally believe that he can share a lot with you. I mean, he he started like a, he started a company from zero to, to make it to get like a, I don't know get like a one million followers for his company, work in over seventy countries, uh, do I don't know thousand programs a year. And uh, he also started very young. When he was sixteen years old, he used to sell websites, design and sell websites. And so he's always been very entrepreneurial since a very early age. Later on in his life, he uh, started a business in the dating, uh, in the dating world. Uh, he was running it all online, and he, was, he started to run programs everywhere, all around the world. Uh, that's where he really got a lot of success. Nowadays, uh, he's, also, he's also a business coach. He has a, he's doing programs on how to become a better entrepreneur, a better businessman. And he's also doing an MBA in Harvard. So. Uh, I'm sure he's, he can open up our minds and please ask all the questions you have. I mean, use this moment. I encourage you to just take everything, everything out what you have because uh, these opportunities just have to be used. You can start. Cool, thanks. So uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not doing an MBA at Harvard, but uh, I am studying law at Harvard and doing oh, a master's sorry. program there. I've already done two MBA programs. I think business education is great. I did my first at Loyola Marymount University, my second one at USC. And I did uh, film school out there. I also went to uh, hotel school at Cornell. Um, my vast uh, experience in education in terms of academics inspired by my parents. My parents were in education. My dad was the president of DeVry, which is a university. And then my mom was a kindergarten teacher. And as a result, um, going to programs like this has been something that I've been doing since I was a kid. I'd go with my dad, and he would take me to business conferences and he'd also taken me to computer science conferences, so I was really into technology. My dad also had a consulting business for business, and he also consulted with uh, you know, universities and even the CIA to get uh, more students to transition into their operations. Uh, I also um, always loved the entrepreneurial experience. So I, I guess I'm curious, just because I've interviewed Thomas about the previous trip camp students at Stanford University, who here is presently the owner of a business? Okay. And who here considers himself an entrepreneur? Cool. It's interesting because uh, most of the hands went up when they said that, but most of you guys haven't created a company yet. Why, why, why do you say you're an entrepreneur? You don't have a business yet. Uh -huh. um, I am just trying to refine my idea. So I haven't I've set up the, the legal side of it, but I haven't started with the actual work because I'm trying to get myself in the right focus. Okay, that makes sense. My, my wife's in the same situation. She's in the exact same area right now. Um, so uh, just to, to clarify also a little bit about my background. So I, I started off always wanting to create random businesses because I felt like I couldn't get employed. When I was a kid, I, I was volunteering for uh, HP. I was just showing people how to use the internet. But I did it for fun because I was a nerd. But what I wanted to do was make money. So I went to McDonald's and I couldn't get a job. I was too young. I went to Burger King, Taco Bell. These places wouldn't hire me. Now maybe, maybe in certain cities in Latin America you could hire people, but you, know, you have to be, uh, I think, 16 and a half or something like that in, in America to get a job. So I started creating websites. And after I made some money, 
I started bartering, like for expensive suits or for horse riding lessons or polo lessons. And then that turned into me wanting to get into finance. So I created a finance firm because no investment firm would also hire me. I was too young. I was uh, 18 at the time. So I created my own financial investment firm and I sponsored myself to get licensed to sell stocks and bonds, mutual funds, insurance. And I eventually got into that world for a while. But I, what I really wanted to do was work in high level finance in New York. But it didn't happen because I kind of got stuck into entrepreneurship through the random route, the surprise route. A lot of people will come across an idea and they'll think, wow, this is awesome. And then I want to create a business about it. And I'll have a game plan for technology and for various things in real estate or for medical supplies. I, I try to do a little bit of everything. I was the guy who was in you know, the uh, Asian American club, the Irish club, and the African American club. I was in the guy in the Electrical Engineering Association, the Biology Association, the Computer Science Student Association. I was trying to learn everything. And my dad would always say, hey, you're the, the jack of all trades and the master of none. But I feel like by learning so many different things, that allows me to become a better, better general manager, someone who has a wide, wide variety of experience. So what I got into was um, being someone who was very studious growing up. But when I went to college, I felt like I wanted to have a soul circle, a lot of fun. So I started throwing big parties. I started renting out uh, yachts and nightclubs. And I didn't really have a lot of friends growing up outside of like my neighbors or the people who lived by me or Boy Scouts, because I was like an Eagle Scout. So what I wanted to do was um, learn how to meet girls in bars and clubs. I wanted to be able to pick up girls. Nothing to relate to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But I felt like um, I had a lot of girls that were interested in me because I was outgoing. But they were interested in you know, being my friend, and not actually dating me. Mm -hmm. So I decided that um, I was going to follow the advice of one of my fraternity brothers. So I joined a fraternity, which is like this mansion that you could live at, but you pay a membership fee while you're in, in school as a student. And uh, one of my fraternity brothers said, hey, you should check out this website. It's a website I met my business partner on, but it was called fastseduction.com. So kind of weird place to meet a business partner. But uh, it was a place that I went to because they were talking about how to meet girls and how to get attraction and stuff like that. So I got addicted to studying this site, and um, I ended up meeting up with these people that were on the website. They all had nicknames. My nickname was Papa. We all had hacker nicknames, like Zippity Dragon or whatever. Really weird. But um, I actually thought that some of these guys were really cool. Some of them were willing to meet up with me. You could see what city they're from. So I said, hey, you to send a private message here from this city. I want to meet up with you. I'll, I'll travel to you. I read your field report about picking up some beautiful girl. And I, I thought it was really funny. And so I did that, and I spent all my money. And then I spent all my money on my credit card. And uh, I had about $60,000 spent just traveling to meet up with guys because I got addicted. It was like a drug to try to learn how to meet girls, which is you know, kind of weird, but it made sense being a, a, a nerdy Asian dude that uh, was super excited that I could actually start a conversation with the girl and know an idea what to say. We were talking earlier about how he thought I had to go to acting school. Because I used to write about how I'd memorize hundreds of pages of scripts. Now people do that in speeches and presentations. Um, but I was just rehearsing all day these, these pickup lines, which was you know, the foundation to actually become natural and actually be able to improvise and actually have a core. But that's what I did because I didn't really feel like I was enough. So a lot of what we teach is about confidence, how to make yourself feel like you're enough. But well, what I did was met these guys until I got an email from a kid who was a student. And he was probably one of the strangest people on the planet. Probably still is. I haven't kept in touch with him. Because he had a tattoo on his arm and said, for a good time, call my mom. And underneath that was his mom's phone number. And he'd walk up to girls very proudly showing that tattoo in order to the belief that he could attract these girls. And this all relates to business somehow. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. But what happened is this guy, he said, hey, I'll pay for your airfare, and I'll give you lodgings if you meet me. So I said to him that I would do it, but you have to bring my buddy because uh, he wants to come with me. And he said, I'll pay for his airfare, and I'll pay for his lodgings too. So he lived by the beach in San Diego. And he was a 30-year-old undergraduate student, and he was paying for my airfare and lodgings and food and transportation. So I said, yeah, I'll do this for a few weeks. This is awesome. And we helped this guy who was a famous internet troll. You know, a troll is a guy who spends 
thousands of articles just talking crap. And he, uh, he got his first kiss and wrote about it on the internet until thousands of people were reading this article because he was really famous on the internet at the time. And uh, no one believed we were real. So we said, hey, why don't you meet with us at Starbucks? And 30 people showed up. And we said, uh, look, we're going to, we, we spent uh, $600 on airfare um, and food and lodgings to come to New York City, which is where we went to Starbucks. Uh, if one of you guys wants to pay, then uh, come this weekend and we'll actually do this program over three days. And uh, 12 people showed up giving $600. And that's how we decided we could create a business because the next weekend we did it in San Francisco and the weekend after that and the weekend after that until we had uh, three months later people paying 60, 60 uh, people at a time paying $600. And uh, it you know, became a company and we moved into a house in the Hollywood Hills four months later. It was a mansion that is on the market for $45 million. But I was able to rent it at the time for thirteen to 14000 a month, plus utilities. And uh, I filled a room in this mansion with bunk beds and decided that people who wanted to live the stories that I was willing to pay for you know, with my credit card, <laughs> they wanted to live with us. They could pay me $2,000. And we'll give them lodgings in this big mansion and they'll party with us and learn how to meet girls. And you know, one of them is the guy in the back with the black hat right there. <laughs> you know? And uh, basically, uh, it was an awesome program with uh, guys that uh, were teaching this as instructors. They eventually became influencers on the internet. We made them into YouTube celebrities. They were vlogging on the internet and writing email articles. That eventually turned to making videos. And that eventually turned into a subscription base of one to two million followers on these 16 YouTube channels cumulatively. And a social network that we built from scratch before Facebook was really popular. It was like MySpace was popular back then, but it had, didn't have what we needed. So we created this website called rsdnation.com. And we had a platform called howtoattract.com. And then after about, uh, this is back in 2002, 2004, we decided that we wanted to scale. So we decided to create digital membership sites. So every month now, we launch a digital membership site with 40 hours of content where we show guys teaching and they travel from city to city every week. And that's how we make our money. We charge three to six hundred dollars, three hundred dollars for um, a basic mem membership site, and then five hundred for a coaching plus a membership site, or six hundred dollars for all the above plus in the live event. And uh, that's that's basically where I am today. Um, the thing is, that's what you'll hear like in a pit session. You'll basically hear like a thirty-second version. People will say, "Hey, tell me about your company." I'll say, "Well." We're kind of like um, a matchmaking company, like Match.com, but instead of meeting people online, you do it in real life. And then we film the content, we sell it in video membership sites. That's, that's how it sounds. But when people talk about the, the company, what they don't talk about is uh, what it took to get there and the survival techniques. Um, I was uh, telling uh, my friend Thomas here that uh, I was going to walk in here if there was a bunch of entrepreneurs here and try to, try to like, uh, scare everyone if everyone was cocky and everything. And I was going to tell everyone what I really think about entrepreneurship which is that I believe that uh, an entrepreneur, um, uh, you know, you can define yourself as an entrepreneur, but I was going to try to be harsh and say, if you, and who here has made a million dollars and lost a million dollars and still has a business that they're running? And, and that's, that's basically um, what I wanted to say, because when I look at entrepreneurship, there's a lot of peaks and valleys, a lot of ups and downs. And when I walk into a class, here at Stanford, it's kind of like me being a Navy SEAL walking into a room like this and saying that uh, you know 90% of the people in this room won't cut it. But I think that um, we have some interesting guys here. We have a guy who built a business in South Africa that uh, has 20 Ubers and a, and a restaurant. We have um, people in here who built a sports marketing platform that uh, sold to Fox for a ton of money. Uh, we have our company. We do over a thousand programs a year. Uh, we charge two thousand dollars for small programs, three hundred dollars for large programs. We do it uh, over a thousand times a year in two hundred and seventy cities and seventy countries. We have that million person plus uh, YouTube platform. We also have three to four hundred um, other platforms, including uh, two to three hundred Facebook groups with three thousand to fifty thousand members in each of the groups. And we built these tribes and we built all these platforms to build a business. Now, it's easy to look at it. You know, when you're a company that has 
you know, 30 million in revenue. But it's totally different when you're in the business and you're working on the business and you're trying to go up and down. So how do I get from a company that is going from zero to, to 30 million? Well, there was a situation where you know I was traveling around the world, but I bootstrapped the whole thing. I didn't have investment money. I was crashing on the floors of random people that I met on the internet. And I was willing to risk it to the point where I didn't stay, care who I was staying with. As a guy, it's a lot safer to do that. I know I should recommend girls to do that. But I, do, I did meet girls who were couchsurfing also, from couchsurfing.com. That's a platform that my friends were using to crash on couches while traveling around the world trying to meet people to build a business. I was using discussion boards on the internet. Creepy discussion boards like fastdetection.com that don't exist anymore. Mm. Kind of uh, interesting. But I went from a situation where he built this company in this mansion to a situation where people didn't want to fly to LA because the recession in America hit in 2008 where the real estate bubble burst and everyone lost their money and people didn't have disposable income. So instead of uh, a situation where people were flying to me, I had to you know, change my business model. But I was reluctant, I was stubborn. And as a result, I ended up in 2008 both making it onto the 86 fastest growing company in the 500 list based in California to uh, being a company that was losing $6,000 a day in the same year. I sold everything I owned. I was living for two weeks in the back of a used Toyota in an airport parking lot. Because at that Sheraton LAX, I was able to sneak and use their free Wi-Fi and their gym and eat their bananas and apples that were in the lobby. And that's how I lived. If I really wanted to go to Lux, I'd spend a dollar and I would buy uh, some chips and salsa from the local Mexican restaurants and have unlimited free refills of chips and salsa and water. And I did that for weeks until I found a magazine in the Sheraton that someone left behind from the airplane that said that uh, these, there's, a, there's a map in the back. I took the map out. It had all the different cities that Star Alliance flies to. And I just decided that I was going to put all the cities on the map, fly to all those cities by sending an email. We had 600,000 people on our email list. I sent an email to them. I said, hey, who wants to give us a free place to crash? And so I got volunteers from a thousand people. And I flew to those cities and I was able to do a program in those cities and sell my program. You put me in front of an audience, I could show fancy videos of our guys, teaching people self-improvement, share some ideas about how this stuff about picking up girls actually will help you in networking and business. And I get all these people to sell, you know, I was able to sell about two, three million dollars worth of programs. I went to 270 cities in 70 countries over a six month period and I did that. And I met my wife and I retired from my company for three or four years. <coughs> I hired a team to run my company. So I had to learn how to delegate after that. I was micromanaging everything. I had to build a team. And I built uh, 10 teams that travel around the world like rock stars with an administration, a business administration, goes from city to city with camera crews. And then we also built our, our business in another mansion in Hollywood Hills. And we also uh, built it in offices attached to the world's largest strip club, Sapphire. So it's funny, I'll take my parents to the strip club and they won't see any girls because they'll see my offices, which are actually behind the strip club. We, we do we use the showroom for seminars. So a lot of people will talk to me about you know, the, the interests of what they want before the seminar. So a lot of people said they want to know, how do you build a brand, how do you build both your individual brand and also your business brand through social media, since this is what we did. So the first thing is that we wanted to do was we wanted to find the content that people actually wanted. And that was usually from the standpoint of us because we wanted desperately to learn how to like date girls, how to text the girls, how to call them, how to say stuff to them. And then I replicated that <coughs> for business by saying, okay, what do I desperately want to learn from business? I want to learn how to scale a business from one to 10 million, then from 10 million to 100 million. How do I do that? Uh, who are the, how to meet uh, celebrities, how to get them to basically join my soul circle. So, I created a YouTube channel to interview a bunch of them and allow me to promote the channel because it's, it's grown quite fast. Um, I, created, I created a channel on YouTube, which is my name, Nick Co. last name is called K-H-O. And uh, you know, it's grown to a good number of subscribers, I think like 50,000 and millions of views. And I have promoted it through my own network. But I've also had to grow up from scratch by targeting content that I thought was really interesting, interviews. And I also eventually want to turn it into a book the other things about social media that I thought was really cool is that's a platform that we could really launch our brand out there through video content. YouTube, IG, I do videos, well, on IG I do videos every day of the week, Instagram twice a week, Twitter, you know, every day of the week, we launch videos. And then on my platforms I have teams of people who do that as well. So 
I thought it would be really cool to get more into entertainment because I believe that today, if a business wants to get a brand out there, you have to educate, not just you know, be a brand that services people. So I decided that I, first of all, wanted to create a YouTube channel to make it interesting. I wanted to learn how to rap as a hip hop rapper. Well, I'd rap about business education. You know, so I hired a hip hop coach. And you know, I would say, step one, hire a mentor, deliver value to they got what they sent for. And I would rap about business education. I was planning to make a series of hip hop videos. So I started promoting other rappers and making music videos so learn how to make videos for them. And I thought that was a way that I could develop my own personal brand. That turned into me doing interviews. And then what I did was I decided, you know what, I can make a full on hip hop musical. So I started studying Hamilton. I sent a, several dozen of people on my staff to Hamilton, started networking in the music industry and helping them for free. Volunteering my video services, promotion, invite people out to dinner and stuff. My, my strongest skill set, I want to take a step back, is I'm really big into networking because since I was a kid, you were 12 years old. I was volunteering my services to promote a nightclub. Then I would promote parties when I was in college. Now I'm promoting a business. But from the very early age, I was always interested in volunteering my services to help other people promote their businesses. That allowed me to build a network. So I built this network to build a musical. And I got invited to go to the Tonys. I started putting on charity auctions and being producers. I've now done this since January. And I met the producers of every musical on Broadway. And I also started networking then from the film world. Because all the people in Broadway say, hey, you should make it into a film. Make a film about the story of your company. And so what I started doing is I started meeting up with film producers. And uh, they said, make digital media production. Broadcast media is dying. Uh, most of my friends don't subscribe to satellite television. I don't know anyone that has a newspaper anymore. The way technology is changing is anyone in this room could be an influencer and have more power than a corporate brand because you're someone they can trust. I'm doing my Harvard thesis about the legal ramifications of how the media will try to get quick bait. They're not necessarily a trusted resource anymore, and I believe that uh, the libel rules need to change because I believe that the way things are is the media and journalists are just like every person in this room. They're basically just influencers. So we can leverage that because if we don't, then you're going to be replaced. Right now, any of us, uh, if you're in America, as a person on social media, could be considered a public figure, which means that people can say anything about you, whether it's true or false, and you can't be sued and you can't be... I mean, you can be sued, but you can't really win a case for it unless there's proven malicious intent. And um, I think that's really interesting because Right now, we're all viewed as potential brands, as individuals. And I believe that entrepreneurs in the future, instead of being people that are um, you know, just people that have a business, that made a million, lost a million, and still want to run a business, all of us will have to be entrepreneurial in one sense or another. And it's a skill set you have to have or else you won't be employable because in the future, I believe that smaller businesses will be so plentiful. I, I look at developed areas like in Latin America and Africa, and there's so much of a gap that needs to be filled by businesses, so it's pretty far from that. But I believe that it will happen eventually, but it was happening a lot faster here in America where the number of businesses that are out there are so plentiful that pretty much everyone in your soul circle will have had a business, whether it's a small eBay store or something larger. And I think that when you have kids, all your kids will have some kind of entrepreneurial venture as well. Um, I think that a lot of people just don't jump in on it. I think that the fact that you're all young, most of you are around uh, 20 to 25, it's that you're already on technology from a big way. So you're going to be focusing more on VR technology or Pokemon Go <laughs> and how like Pokemon Go geotarget technology will allow people to have integrated video game systems where people could have reward systems in your business as a loyalty rewards program as opposed to just earning points and cashing it in. I believe that the, the future is also going to be the fact that all businesses will be creating their own short films and brands and movies, um, and it's going to be a lot easier. I mean, right now we have a ten to twenty thousand dollar rig in here that made feature that makes feature films that were made ten years ago look really horrible in terms of film production quality. And they used to spend a lot more money. I used to spend on one video membership site three to four hundred thousand dollars just in video production and putting everything together. I do the same thing now for one percent of the cost. And I think it's amazing because I'll still make the same amount of money launching a video membership site. And I think that it's not just about education, it's about infotainment. So infotainment is a combination of education and entertainment at the same time. And I believe that if you don't have those two combined together, you're in trouble.
But I guess what I wanted to do is uh, open it up to questions and kind of find out about what you guys are interested in talking about. So I have a shotgun mic here, so if you guys raise your hand, I can answer any of your questions. Uh, with which type of influencers do you work with? Like, how do you determine the number of followers to be considered like a good influencer for you? If you have at least 10,000 followers on YouTube, oh, on then YouTube. you could you could get uh, into YouTube spaces and meet a ton of influencers. I did that. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to work with influencers that have almost any following, but they would be on content on my channel that could add more content because I know that they want to try. But if they want to have me on their channel to help me promote my brand, I'm looking for people that have influence that's you know, 10, 20, 30,000 or more. But I'll, I'll, I'll do it for any kind of influencer. Because even if it's an influencer that's in music, I'll go on music influencers channels, <coughs> celebrity influencers like Tidy or Nicole Arbor, but I'll also go on business influencer channels, like the people who created The Secret, or people that um, own a podcast for real estate. Because I can talk about business, I can also talk about personal conflicts and challenges. So I'll send my team of instructors on influencers of everyone from feminist spiritual leaders to fitness uh, trainers that are in Toronto doing it out of a mansion that's like the Batman man. Um, so I'll do it for any kind of influence. But um, my thing now is most of my friends are influencers that have video game companies, they have some kind of entertaining, entertaining uh, comedy show, they'll have pretty much anything. Because as long as I could get in front of the audience, I could still spin my message and talk about what I'm doing. Um, I also know that most influencers are friends with lots of other influencers. Because if you are not, it's almost impossible to build a network. We're at a standpoint where the saturation on almost all the major platforms, Snapchat, YouTube, IG, Twitter, and all the other ones are kind of saturated. You really have to leverage existing influencers if you want to get out there because there's too much out there. It's really difficult to start from scratch right now unless you already have a platform like Twitch or something you want to move it over. So um, I look into buying platforms. I know guys who sell a channel of a half a million subscribers, they'll sell for $23,000. That's a lot of money. That's a big channel. You can make millions off that channel. I also know that a typical influencer channel network, let's say that you have a, a major enterprise like IGN, and you have like 10 million subscribers and like uh, 100,000 views, and you try to monetize it. Well, I was telling someone earlier that if you have like 100,000 views, you're gonna make $100. If you're gonna monetize just an advertising. If you, but your sponsors are gonna be based on the views because people believe that's not about the views, the sponsors, old, old thinking. But if you have, um, let's say, 100,000 followers and you're a regular, actively engaging YouTube person, you can not just have those views, but you just sell a product and you can you know, make a few million dollars off that product, you have 100,000 views per channel. You can sell your own products and send people to your own channels as opposed to other people's advertising. Um, yeah. Um, when you feel like an entrepreneur, when you say, oh my god, I'm an entrepreneur, and it's cool. When, when, when do I feel like an entrepreneur? Sure? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I was talking to uh, Thomas earlier. I think that he had a good example. Because as soon as he said it, he said that he had a relative and his thought about being an entrepreneur was that he looked at his money as something that was everywhere. And that um, he was able to take the risks of losing everything again and again and again all the time because uh, money was everywhere, it was plentiful, and he had a lot of friends. That's basically the mindset of an entrepreneur. Is, um, I'm willing to risk it all every day, and I do. I'll, I'll take bets that if I fail, I lose everything. Um, but I don't fail. <laughs> so I do that pretty much all the time, every day. And that's what an entrepreneur is to me. Um, but the reason why I'm able to risk it all is because I do have a powerful network. Your network is your real net worth. People say it's cliche, but it's because I have a fallback plan. I have friends, I have family, I have people that I know of that if I really needed to get a job, I could do that. Um, I also have money saved away. Uh, I've never had to get invested money from friends or family. 
Um, I remember I got money from a client once. He loaned me uh, $20,000 and I paid it back a year later. And it was a horrible experience because uh, the whole time, that whole year, he was nagging me, angry at me. And it's, I'm not sure if we're really uh, considered good friends anymore because I haven't talked to him for several years. <laughs> you know? um, but I know a lot of people who have raised money, especially in the capital intensive businesses. Like if you want to do a Broadway show, if you want to do a technology company or real estate, you usually have to get invested money. And I've raised $2 million, but then I've declined all the money. I just want to see if I can do it. <laughs> Why did you decide to uh, go for YouTube and not any other platform? Oh, I did do every platform. We're on, uh, we did everything. Starting with MySpace. <coughs> yeah, the day. Really? And this one proved to be the most successful. So we're, we are still on every platform. If I post something on one platform, that video is going to be posted by my team to every other social media that exists on the planet. Because YouTube has become more friend, family friendly and more censored. And as a result, every influencer is scared that at any time they'll be kicked off. Some platforms like Twitch or video gamers, <coughs> if you wear a bikini, you could lose your entire following. I know a girl who was making a half million a year plus. And then she got uh, her account suspended because she wore a bikini. I think people are becoming a little bit too uh, conscious about these kind of things. You know, it's ridiculous. But that's why you have to leverage something. You should build your own platform. You should have a website that people should go to also and build that. You have to have backup plans. In the same way, you can't rely on the news from one news agency. You, know, you need to get your news from everywhere to get the truth. The same thing goes for business. I mean, in this world, I don't just learn from, say, uh, business from school. I mean, you're a trip camp. I mean, I spent over a million dollars over five years for my wife and I. to go to masterminds like this every week for five years. I was traveling every week for five years. Went to 110 countries. Got engaged with my wife in my 100th country, where I rented an island in the Maldives. We posted me a video of that. Posted that on Vimeo, not even YouTube. But I had the ability to take it down when I wanted. Or you can control your brand in so much of a better way than even the mainstream media. The reason why, and it's super important, because the mainstream media is just people like on YouTube. The only difference is that they got hired by a company, and there's, you know, a few of them in all sorts of cities around the world because they could afford a platform that other people couldn't get on. Now you all have access. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will let you ask how do you keep the viewership of the YouTube channel? Regular, regular posts of great content that you know your subscriber base likes. So if you want to do at least once a week, that's a great start. I do it twice a week. I know people that do it every day of the week. But you should have a clear expectation for your subscriber base, so it's not like on the first one month, you know, on the 27th of next month is random. And that's just your content are like two hour feature films that takes a long time to trade, you know. <laughs> should you have long gaps? Um, I think that you should also create content that you know that your partners will like. So you should partner with other influencers, people in this room or elsewhere. You just message any influencer from your social media. That's how I get a hold of my influencers. And you call them and you invite them to lunch in your city or when you travel to a city like San Francisco, LA, almost anyone you contact that's an influencer will you know, read your messages somehow. I mean, I'll, you can contact millionaire entrepreneurs. I mean, I used to you know, just go to the Yelp pages. There's a guy who's an inventor. I want to say, what's an inventor? A patent attorney. I'll invite him out to lunch and dinner. So I still do that today. I mean, I have friends who are friends with Richard Branson just because they decided to email what they thought was his email address and they got a hold of him. Uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, what was your favorite episode so far that you remember? Like <laughs> On YouTube? Yeah. Or anywhere? Yeah. Like well, I, I like watching video game channels. So there's a show on Reckless Store 2 called Online Gamer, which is a funny show. But as for entertainment purposes, um, I got most of my entertainment online. I don't pay for cable TV. I watch Netflix, iTunes, and YouTube as my main source of entertainment. I got the Pacquiao uh, Mayweather fight for one day and unsubscribed from Kip Toast. You mentioned early, earlier uh, that you focus a lot on education, like you like to you know, 
uh, like to studies and so on, you are doing something <coughs> right now at, at, at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, how, when do you think, I mean, how do you balance education and experience? When do you think, like, okay, I should stop here my education and I should continue developing my business or something like that? Well, education should never stop. And your business work should never stop. You have the hustle. I mean, there's no continuing education credits for entrepreneurs like there is in, say, being an attorney. But uh, you have access to so many resources to continue to educate yourself. So I, I, I keep going all the time. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, what research uh, methodologies do you use to find out what your subscribers want to, like, hear or what they want from you so that you always remain relevant? That's a great question. I mean, the reason why I was reading the surveys that you all felt that you should fill out about what you were interested in beforehand, the reason why I asked Thomas about who the people in the audience is, because you've got to know your target demographic. Now, what I think is the easiest way to do it on social media is that they have comments. They can give you feedback, and you could ask for them to give you those comments and questions on there. I give out my email and uh, do that to everyone, because it's almost nobody responds. If you want to contact me, it's nick, N-I-C-K, at co, K-H-O, dot B-I-Z. And it's an easy way to contact me. You can also contact me with my social media. But you know what? Uh, most people don't do that. You know, I would say like less than 1% of people do. Um, but it is those people that are willing to take the time to comment you that will give you the best questions and best shows. I mean, I've created shows just off one comment. I've created actually over a dozen shows or more just off one comment for video content. Uh, we've created full service 40 hour video programs based on one question on a discussion board. So I look for that. I also look for communities of the topic that I'm most interested in, where people are asking questions and trying to fulfill that need. And that's what my mentor, uh, Corey Rudel, wrote. He, wrote, he made a book. It was called Insider Secrets to Internet Marketing by Corey Rudel, R E D L. It doesn't exist anymore for sale, but you can find it on somewhere on the internet, somewhere. He died in a car accident. Listen. Uh, it's called Insider Secrets of Internet Marketing. That was my Bible. It's a 1,000 page Bible on marketing. And the most memorable thing to me about that book was he said that he created his companies by seeing what people were talking about on the internet or what people were talking about in your social circle or elsewhere. What, what is it that they just can't get? And if it's being talked about somewhere, it's probably a need that needs to be fulfilled in that community and elsewhere. Fulfill that. Now you get to do it even as a self-employed one-person contractor. You have a business. You keep doing it again and again and again. So you need to hire people and then charge a margin for those people to work below you. Um, funny thing is I had a friend who hired a Filipino worker and paid $10 an hour to get this person to do work 24 hours a day. Um, they would bill by the hour to do phone calls. And that person got so much business in terms of phone calls that that person hired five people that was paid eight dollars an hour and cut the margin on that. <laughs> it wasn't discovered until years later that uh, there was a business created by hiring that one person. But most any contract, plumber services, janitorial services, uh, hot dog stands that turn into restaurants, they start off with a small business and they grow up from there. That's how I started. I started off as a sober buyer. And before I was even incorporated, we made revenue in the first three months in business of uh, $400,000. Then we made um, $700,000 the next year of uh, being incorporated. So that was a million dollars our first year. So that's, that's a way to grow organically. I think I believe firmly in growing organically as a safe way to grow a business as opposed to raising a bunch of money and getting some payroll from someone else's investment money that you, you pocketed. Because you don't really know how to run a business, so you can hire the right people. Um, but that's a different style of business. There's two different ways of running a company. Uh, you can do it the, the VC investment route, you can do it my route, the bootstrapping route. But there's a lot more fast growth when you do it the, the money raising way, but there's a lot of profit when you own anything. Sorry, one more question. How do you decide, like when your business is starting to grow and stuff, how do you decide how much to pay yourself? That's a good question because. What happens when you run a company is you end up trying to just pay yourself enough to survive. And then I read a book by a guy named Vern Harnish. What? Vern Harnish, V-E-R-N-E-H-A-R-N-I-S-H. He created the Entrepreneurs Organization, which is 30,000 something entrepreneurs make over a million a year. I was a member. And 
I created this EOS Entrepreneur Operating System, which inspired a book Traction and a bunch of other famous basic books that everyone has to read. And he said in his book, before creating Gazelles, which is his entrepreneur company, that you should pay yourself 10% of your revenue. The problem is when 10% of your revenue is like $100. <laughs> you know? So you should have, you have a job as a backup, or just try to make it so that you build a company without necessarily making a profit the first year. I mean, if you look at the history of American companies, you know, companies that are in a first world country where there's a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of great business, first three years of a company, usually 90% of the time have losses, no profits. In five years, that's the case with 99% of the companies. It gets worse over time. Now, I had a situation where it was different. I was spending everything because my company was fun, so everything I did was fun. So whether it was work or play, I was going to spend all of it. I mean, I'm learning video production, I'm going out there meeting new people, traveling. So everything in my life was R&D at the same time. Everything in my life was a situation where I was really doing R&D, because <laughs> it was actually that. Um, other people, though, if they have a real estate company, but people that are different. Or a technology company that's different. It's more capital intensive. You have to hire programmers from the very beginning. Um, so paying yourself could be a challenge. Now, we're in a situation where my board, the board of directors and the board of advisors, wants me to go back to a flat salary. Well, we used to do that, plus a percentage of profits. The challenge is when you're investing most of your money in growth, it's really hard to predict your budgets. And it's gonna be a challenge when you guys are in growth mode. It's kind of funny being in growth mode. Like we started in 2002, we're 15 years deep, but uh, we target growth at 20% year to year, which is doubling our size every four years. And it gets more difficult to do that every year. In order to do that every year, we still have to take the same risks now that we did a decade ago. <laughs> and that makes it really difficult to decide how much money to pay yourself. But I, I could be happy off a little bit. I'd be happy off a lot of money. But I mean, I would say that having a lot of money opens up way more doors than having a lot of money. Okay. Um, okay, so you talk about journalism, media, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, I'm a communication student, yeah. so I am thought to be a journalist and all that stuff. But then you realize that in real life, the influencers are not people who have like the basis of communication. Like uh, maybe an engineer can be an influencer and has more power than a um, journalist. Well, so I can't like, quite say that. No, I, well, yeah, yeah. It, I think that studying journalism is useful for that engineer. No, but not like, guys, like even an engineer can come to influencer. Yeah, so the question here would be, what do you need to become an influencer, like, it's really difficult right now on YouTube because there's like a lot, lots of channels and ideas and people. So what do you need to become an influencer? Sure. Well, I do think that a lot of the skills from the same communication are super important. In fact, I think that the highest paid occupations today are people that are able to do public speaking. Uh -huh. So if you want to see a chief level person, like a CEO, CTO, CSO, CO, whatever, they're all going to be good in terms of public speaking, and if they don't study communications, yeah, uh -huh. they're going to have to because their boards are going to require them. They're not just study journals, public relations, in person communications, but they're going to have to be masterful mm -hmm. at those skills. Storytelling is now a skill set that if you don't have, you're irrelevant. Not just in terms of being a movie producer, but in terms of explaining your brand, your story, doing it fast. Okay. Now, I think that. These skills are more valuable than anything else. The networking skills, the biggest a connector, being able to come to the right mindset, super important. I mean, I created a program called RSD Founders Club, where I coach entrepreneurs about how the skills in dating apply to business. Because what we teach has a lot of that. And also, talks about the mindsets. Because a lot of people, if you're in this room and you're saying entrepreneurship, you don't have a company yet, a lot of them are scared of that risk. They're scared of the unknown. Now, there's good reason to be. <laughs> but actually, actually, if you take a shot, the rewards are super high. The only thing is, you have to be willing to sacrifice. 
There's only so much you can lose. If you have a, if you have a, a basis of family and friends, and you're going to lose everything, um, then you can become an entrepreneur safely. You know, because when you lose everything, you still have your loved ones, your friends, your family, a safety net. You're not going to starve.